Yosemite Valley is the epicenter of the American rock climbing world. From the early days of John Muir to more recent achievements like Free Solo, there's always been something mythical and transcendental about the valley, and it's where many of the most significant climbs in the sports history have taken place. In 1988, a series of events culminated in one of the most impressive and monumental climbs of all time. This is the story of the last great ascent in Yosemite history, which marked the end of an era and kicked off the modern world of climbing we know today. It's a fun one with a couple of wayward cowboys, a near-death fall, and a garage sale in the Camp 4 parking lot that funded a mad dash up the Salafe. So join me as we flash back to the 80s, the Stonemasters, and the day that Todd Skinner and Paul Piana found their place in climbing history. Hey guys, sorry for my brief hiatus as I've been living in a van, but we're back from the back of said van, and today we're looking at the story of the first free ascent of El Capitan. To understand this story, and to understand why I love it so much, you need to know the main character, and that's Todd Skinner. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Todd Skinner was one of the most influential, talented, and genuinely beloved rock climbers in America. A cowboy who grew up on a ranch in Wyoming, Skinner left on a climbing break and never came back. Soon, he was traveling around America, chasing the weather and constantly training, eager to be among the upper echelon of climbers at the time. Reading about Skinner, the only words I can come up with to describe him are genuine or maybe pure? Those who knew him describe him as endlessly optimistic, charming, and happy. He asked people questions and remembered what they said. Even the climbers who disagreed with Skinner's ethics enjoyed his personality, his boundless sense of adventure, and his constant urging to get them to leave their house, wife, kids, and dog to hit the road with him in pursuit of fame, glory, and the American dollar. One of the things that I find sort of tragic about Skinner is that he never quite broke through. He had a goal of being the first American to send 514, and by all accounts, he was maniacal in his pursuit of it. He never quite got there, but in the 80s, a new challenge began to emerge, and this is where Skinner would entrench his name in climbing history. Around 1980, the climbing world began to turn their attention towards the idea of a free ascent of El Capitan. Now, it should be noted that the west face of El Cap was freed in 1977 by Ray Jardine. However, many people didn't consider this a true El Cap route because of how far it is off to the side of the wall, and so the questions lingered. Could El Cap ever be free climbed? It's so big, so blank. Was it possible? In 1979, two climbers by the name of Mark Hudden and Max Jones made a speed run up the Salafe Wall, climbing in a style that they called free as can be. Basically, what pitches they could free climb they did, but they used aid on the hardest sections of the route, which turned out to only be about 300 feet. Hudden and Jones's attempt set the bar for what was possible on El Cap, and people began to talk. Just how hard would those 300 feet be? 513? 514? Many thought El Cap remained undoable, but a few optimists saw Hudden and Jones's ascent as a sign that Yosemite's grandest wall would someday go free. Todd Skinner was one of those people, and he saw El Cap as one of the last great challenges in the climbing world. In 1985, he began to look for a partner, and he soon settled on Paul Piana. I need to spend some time here talking about Paul, because this story isn't just about Todd, but first, I need to talk quickly about today's sponsor, Surfshark. Guys, everyone knows that protection is important. When you're climbing, you bring your cams and a helmet. When you're surfing the internet, you need to bring Surfshark to keep you safe. Surfshark is a VPN that masks what you do online. Anytime you want to connect to the internet, all of your information is available for the world to see. Surfshark is like a filter, blurring out and disguising all of your personal info from hackers so that you can surf in privacy. Surfshark lets you safely connect anywhere, even public networks, and do whatever you need, like checking your banking info, without having to worry that someone might be snooping on you. They can even stop you from getting personalized ads and prevent big tech companies from seeing your data. Say you don't care about safety, guess what? Surfshark is still useful. 
It lets you travel the world virtually to view shows on streaming platforms like I Can Still Get The Office on Netflix, get past geo filters, and see deals that may not be allowed in your home country. Whatever you need it for, get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals/ascensionism and enter the promo code ascensionism for 83% off and three extra months free. Born in Wyoming in the 1950s, Paul Piana says that the pioneering spirit of his family, who were some of the first into the state, was ingrained into him at a young age. He had dreams of being a fighter pilot, but early on in his life he discovered rock climbing and it's been his calling ever since. Him and Todd Skinner were longtime climbing partners. Todd first approached Paul with the idea of free climbing Salafay in 1985, and the two hatched a plan to be the ones to do it. Before they could make an attempt though, they had to plan it, and their planning had to be done in absolute secrecy. Now, the lengths that these two went to prevent other climbers from finding out about their goal is hilarious. They would compare notes, commit them to memory, and then burn the paper, shipping the ashes off to the far ends of the world. They kicked their girlfriends out of the houses to prevent them from overhearing. They went so far as to try to wear disguises in the Camp 4 parking lot so that people wouldn't know that Todd and Paul were around, which went horribly, but I guess they tried? This is what I love about this story. Not the hard climbing or the historic element of it, but how important it was to these two, how seriously they took it, and how ridiculously fun it was. They were terrified of other climbers doing it first, and so they went to outrageous lengths to preserve the first ascent. Only so much planning could be done in a basement, though. In 1988, Todd and Paul made a series of reconnaissance trips up the Salafay Wall, but things didn't go well. The climbing was brutally hard, and by August, the two were convinced that they would need at least another season of work before it would go. Additionally, they were out of money. Now, I don't just mean that their credit cards were maxed. They genuinely had a combined net worth of $12.47, and they couldn't buy enough food to make a serious attempt on Salathay. So, the two faced a decision. They could go for Salathay, but it was really unlikely that the route would go, and going for it would blow their cover. Plus, where would they get money for a week on the wall? Alternatively, they could retreat from the valley, train in the off-season, and come back next year, but by that point, someone may have sent the route their dream would be gone. If you think they were going to play it safe, wait, and risk someone else snatching their route, I clearly haven't described Todd Skinner well enough. These two looked at a deck that was stacked against them and pushed all in. First, they had a yard sale in the Camp 4 parking lot, selling off everything they owned, a new pair of shoes, some cams, a hangboard, to raise funds. By the end of it, they had no worldly possessions other than what they needed for the climb, but they had a hundred bucks in food money, and so they cashed it in and headed for the base of Salathay. What followed was an ascent of epic proportions. It was the type of adventure that the climbing world simply doesn't see nowadays. The two blazed up the first ten pitches before entering uncharted territory. Todd started up an unprotectable 5-9 off with, struggling with the unfamiliar style of climbing. Unbeknownst to him, his rope was too short to complete the pitch, so while Todd was still fighting for his life a thousand feet off the ground, Paul untied from his anchor and simul climbed up behind him, free soloing the off with with his leader not even knowing that he was gambling with his life. It didn't stop there. The pair was met with pitch after pitch of hard, unclimbed granite in the high 12s and low 13s. They pushed their way up, tearing their skin and racking up minor injuries, but somehow, impossibly, gaining ground on the massive Salathay headwall. Finally, they cranked through the last hard pitches of the Great Roof, cruised the easier top section, and reached the finish. Their adventure wasn't over yet. When hauling their gear up the final pitch, the boulder that they had used as their belay gave out, crushing Paul's legs, throwing Todd off the edge, and snapping their anchor. Only a backup piton that Paul had clipped as an afterthought saved the two of them from a certain death. The pair limped their way down to the Yosemite Medical Clinic. They were broken and hurt, but they were alive, and they had completed their days-long epic to become the first pair ever to free climb the world-famous El Capitan. 
In the title, I called this Yosemite's Last Great Ascent, and I assume I'm going to catch some flack for that. I want to make clear that I'm not trying to say the achievements that came after this, like Lynn Hill, Don Wall, or Free Solo, aren't great. Progress is still being pushed in the valley. In fact, the Salathe was part of that, as it was one of the first big Yosemite climbs that used rappel reconnaissance and bolting, and it helped to usher in a new era of climbing in America, but there's something missing. With that new era, I do think that adventures like this have been somewhat lost. There's something about this story that I just can't shake. It's the old school nature, a couple of true dirtbags, a stupid dream, code names and disguises, and a yard sale to fund their adventure that I think has somewhat disappeared from climbing. This isn't me trying to criticize modern climbing or lamenting what's been lost, but something has always stuck out to me in the ridiculousness, optimism, and sheer romanticism of when Todd Skinner and Paul Piana auctioned off their lives, racked up their harnesses, and dashed up the Salathe wall on their way to fame, glory, and the American dollar.